Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third installment of the High Elevation Five Needle White Pines Science and Management Webinar Series. This series is brought to you by the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation, whose mission is to promote the conservation of white bark pine ecosystems by supporting restoration, education, management, and research projects that enhance knowledge and stewardship of these valuable ecosystems. The foundation is member-based organization composed of individuals and organizations who share a passion for the education and restoration of unique high mountain ecosystems. If you're interested in joining the foundation, please visit whitebarkfound.org slash membership, and we'll put that link in the chat for you. Today's speaker is Aaron Shanahan. Aaron is an ecologist with the National Park Service Inventory and Monitoring Program in Bozeman, Montana. She has been the lead for the Interagency White Bark Pine Monitoring Program since its inception in, 20, in 2004. Through her work monitoring White Bark Pine, she has had the privilege to visit some of the most magnificent areas in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Erin is honored to work and collaborate with a multitude of dedicated champions of White Bark Pine, including the numerous biological technicians, interns, and volunteers who have helped collect 19 years of monitoring data, managers representing the National Park Service, U.S. Forest Service, BLM, and stati statisticians from the USGS and Montana State University, academic researchers and private entities, um, as we all partner and pool resources and our hopes to shepherd white bark pine through these unsettling times. If you have any questions following Aaron's talk, we encourage you to virtually raise your hand so that we can enable you to unmute yourself and start a dialogue. We have intentionally left 30 minutes after Aaron's talk for this dialogue. So please feel free to share any questions or thoughts out loud. So without any further, further ado, I will turn it over to Erin. Great, thank you, Chloe, for that kind introduction. And um, I actually recorded my presentation because I'm having some computer issues. So um, I wasn't able to advance slides. So if I can get the screen shared. Is it over to me now, Chloe? Yes. Yeah, you should just be able to. Oh, this will stop other screens. Oh, let me, sorry about that. Okay. Um, so yes, I, I'm do, I did a whole introduction on that as well, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and share it and start. Can you see that? Yes, it looks good. Okay. Good afternoon and thank you for Sound being okay? here. Um, my name is Erin Shanahan. Yes. I am a vegetation ecologist with the Greater Yellowstone Inventory and Monitoring Network. And I'm going to be talking today about my experience working with white bark pine in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So I've been contemplating what I wanted to talk about a lot, um, even perseverating on it excessively, you could say, since Chloe asked me if I wanted to present in this forum last fall. And I just want to put out there that I am really stepping out of my comfort zone. Um, so I'd like to set the culture of this talk, which I, I hope will lead more to a fruitful discussion at the end than um, me just like telling you what I think. And um, so I have this slide up here about psychological safety, and it's about creating a space for folks um, that they can speak up without fear of being humiliated or punished or shamed for sharing their ideas, thoughts, or questions. And um, I've been kind of on this soapbox with this idea of psychological safety for a while now. I, I think it um, is really important, especially for younger people coming up in their careers to feel comfortable to show up um, and share their ideas. So, okay, I will get off my soapbox with that. The foundation of my presentation is based on what the science and data are telling us about ecosystem transformation due to rapid climate change in high elevations. And it's also based on my personal experience working in these areas and witnessing some of the changes firsthand. What I'm hoping is that if you aren't thinking this way already, this presentation discussion will lead all of us who care about keeping white bark pine on the landscape to think critically and really realistically about the trajectory of white bark pine given the huge challenges that we face managing not just white bark pine, but so many other natural resources that are threatened by changes we're um, seeing and experiencing right now. 
Because of White Bark Pine, over the past almost 20 years, I've had the privilege and um, been grateful to work, in my opinion, in one of the most spectacular places on earth, the Greater Yellowstone. Hey, Aaron, would you pause it real quick? Around this time, I've walked through the same. Thanks. Um, to the right of the pause button, I think you may be able to increase the volume. In forests year after year, um, I, I visit the That's same a little better. Thanks. And as those of us who work in this ecosystem know, there's been a lot of rapid and alarming transformations in the forests around us. And basically, the summer of 2021 was what I consider a real pivot point for me in terms of my outlook for the future of white bark as we know it in the GYE, and also a shift in my thinking on its role in high elevation ecosystems. Um, and the services that it does or maybe now does not provide. Um, importantly, I want to put out there that I will never give up on white bark pine. I'm not sure about the staying calm part, but um, I, this, I find this tree completely fascinating. So um, I am with it all the way. Most folks on this call are likely familiar with all the virtues of white bark pine, and these are qualities we all use to justify the value of this species. It's a keystone species, it plays a critical role in shaping biodiversity, it's a food source, it slows snowmelt, regulates runoff, which helps slow erosion, um, it's an early establisher in harsh environments, and it populates after fire. Uh, you know, we really include these traits in our publications and our presentations, and I use these in my one-minute elevator pitch when I run into park visitors or anyone asking me about my work. But for me personally, white bark pine trees are simply amazing trees, and they have their own intrinsic value. But unfortunately, that doesn't seem like a good enough selling point when I'm talking to a layperson um, about why this tree is so spectacular. Uh, they, they don't have the star power or name recognition of the giant sequoias. So sometimes I feel like we've had to come up with a list of reasons to justify conservation of white bark pine and why the general public should care enough to keep them on the planet. And I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with the current threats to white bark pine. I started working with white bark pine in the mid 90s when Kate Kendall hired me as a biotech looking at the status of white bark in Glacier, Yellowstone, and Grand Teton National Parks. And then I, I jumped out for a bit and went back to the wildlife world where I'd come from for about a decade. And then I came back to white bark pine to lead the interagency white bark pine monitoring program in 2004, where I am still working today. And over that time period, the threats have continued to be the same to white bark pine, but at times these threats have replaced each other in magnitude, um, and which ones we're worrying about the most in, at a given time. When we started the monitoring program, the main objective was to get a baseline and track the trajectory of white pine blisteros. Mountain pine beetle was really just a, a footnote on our data sheets, actually. But by 2007, beetles were clearly moving to the front of the Agents of Destruction pack, and the monitoring program was able to chronicle the crescendo and then the, if you will, decrescendo of the epidemic. So what we know is that higher temperatures from 2006 to 2008 and plentiful food resources enabled the beetles to go from endemic to epidemic proportions. And in those three consecutive years, temperatures were above the growing degree day threshold where beetles were able to switch from semi-voltine to univoltine. Then the waning of the outbreak may have been due to the October cold snap in 2009 uh, that hit before the beetles got their antifreeze on or they could have eaten themselves out of house and home, or it was probably more likely a combination of the two of those factors. And whether it was the cold snap or the food resource depletion, um, you know, for a while there, I really felt a sense of calm because we weren't seeing much beetle activity at all. Well, we saw nothing really. And I just felt like everything was going to be okay, and we still had a bunch of trees left to help the population recover and uh, based on a lot of the predictive modeling that was going on 
through the outbreak and afterwards, um, you know, we knew that there was always going to be localized endemic activity of mountain pine beetle, but um, these predictive models were saying, you know, we won't see anything on the scale that we just witnessed for for another 30 years, you know, until until the resources um, grew big enough and that kind of thing. So it, was, it actually was a really nice time to be out in the woods. Um, we weren't seeing a lot of mortality of white bark. It was during that time, that period of calm, you could say that David Toma, who um, I work with, he's an ecologist with the monitoring network, and he actually built that Growing Degree Day graph for me. Um, he introduced me to Climate Smart Conservation. And Climate Smart Conservation was originally developed by multiple agencies to help us think about climate change and how we prepare for it. So folks in the MPS who have adopted this framework are using it as a tool to break down this massive issue of climate change into bite-sized pieces that you can think through and work on in a little less overwhelming platform. Uh, the bottom line is that we are rapidly pushing past the guardrails of historical climate variability, so we need to act with intentionality and manage for change and not just persistence of existing or historical conditions. We're not going back. Overall, the goal of this framework is to move understanding into action and relieve anxiety and make adaptation seem possible because it really is. Then I went ahead and I adapted that original diagram in the previous slide to, um, so th that it made more sense to me. Um, and I'm not going to get into too much detail with Climate Smart, but I will say that I really drank the punch on this framework because it does take a daunting task of managing for the persistence of white bark pine into the future and puts it into recipe like steps. For me, that, that just makes more sense to me and how my brain works. But in a nutshell, you identify current management goals. Um, and in this case, it's around preserving white bark pine. And this can be difficult to define, especially when you're considering a species on a broad forest landscape scale. The second part is about assessing threats to white bark pine persistence on the landscape. So exposure is the amount of change experienced by a resource, um, white bark pine is our resource, due to climate change. And sensitivity is how much a resource or white bark pine is impacted by climate change. So I've listed those that, again, most of us are familiar with. And then moving down to number three, uh, what management actions can we take, where to do them, and when? And this number three area really is um, you know, the point of the national strategy effort and, and more regional and local efforts like those um, that are carried out by the GYCC White Bark Pine Subcommittee work. So to date, most management actions really are all about resisting change. And, you know, I've really lived in the assessing and resisting worlds like many people have um, probably on this call on the Climate Smart Framework for the past 20 years. And I've had this, you know, we can do it attitude, and I'm still out there. I'm still out hiking up and down the mountains. I'm sleeping on the ground, I'm not having regular showers. I really believe in this cause. Uh, and there's so many folks like myself out there, and many more who are even more devoted to preserving white bark pine. And then last summer happened. Except for the summer of 2020, I have been going to an area called Commissary Ridge. It's on the southern end of the Bridger Teton Forest every year since 2004. So I, I didn't go in 2020 because of COVID restrictions, but that's the only year I've ever missed. So this year I got up to the top of the ridge and right away I started seeing this unusual mortality and extensive damage on the terminal ends of the uh, white bark pine branches. And it was all along the ridge for miles. It looked like a massive wave event had occurred, but um, we really don't know right now what's going on up there. It's, it was just um, kind of shocking. And so I contacted Nancy Volcano too to see if she had seen, I sent her pictures and um, I just wondered if she had seen some of this. And she said that she also saw similar mortality um, to the east of where we were in the Wood River drainage area. 
So in that same area last year, um, it's the Grays River Labarge drainages. It's flanked by the Wyoming Range and the um, Salt Ranges. We were documenting large areas of recent and current beetle activity too. And we started seeing this uptick in beetle activity, I'd say beginning in 2019. I wasn't that alarmed because it was just pretty localized. Um, then we also saw it in 2020 and others were seeing, reporting that they were seeing this as well, but mostly in the southern areas of the greater Yellowstone. We know that from aerial surveys, from the previous outbreak that we lost about 75 to 80 percent of those overstory trees and but you know there's still a, a lot of live greater than 10 centimeter dbh trees out there and the beetles do appear to be hitting them hard again way earlier than i thought i'd see based on all that predictive modeling and i know we're always going to see beetle activity um, in more endemic localized cases but i feel like what i'm seeing um, has me concerned that this might be a little bigger than that, and it could trend northward similar to the pattern um, that the last epidemic had. It started in the south and then it moved north. And then we also had earlier fires and lots of smoke last year, and over my tenure on this monitoring program, Fires have become an increasing threat every summer in high elevations where they weren't as prevalent in the past. And it just makes um, things pretty tough for us for in our field season because we do have to shift based on, you know, where fires are and we're always looking out for, you know, if there's been lightning. So, so fires are seem to be the norm and the smoke is coming in earlier and earlier every year. We also documented an increase in mistletoe as well last summer. And right now it's mostly on limber pine, but in limber pine stands that are close to or even adjacent to whitebark pine stands. And then there's all sorts of other insects and crud out there taking advantage of the droughty conditions and the warmer temperatures. So rust plus beetles plus fire and plus all these other threats and then there's competition and this crazy mutualism with the bird that can always fly off and find another food source if it needs to and variable recruitment for multiple reasons like shade intolerance, seed predation, or the birds simply aren't caching, all combined with this really slow growth pattern and a tree that isn't all that adaptable. It was just pretty overwhelming last summer when I put all these factors together. And then in the back of my mind, I'm, I'm always thinking about David's growing degree day graph. And what I showed earlier only extended to 2013, but what we'd likely see if I'd been able to get David to update this, he's actually on the Grand Canyon right now. Um, and if he'd been able to extend it the years out to 2020, I really think the line would be positioned above that threshold where the beetles can switch from semi to univoltine. My concerns, and maybe some of yours as well, um, are that all these agents exacerbated by the rapid climate change we are witnessing are happening faster than we can find um, and produce effective management solutions to resist the change. It's also over this broad forest landscape scale um, that in itself is daunting. And I, I guess I really started to question White Bark Pines ecosystem services last summer. And what I am pondering, I did last summer and I still am, is what the term ecosystem services really means when everything is changing so rapidly. And where does White Bark Pine fit into the system now after so much mortality and what looks like will be continued decline of the species? And my question is, what happens when ecosystem services are no longer being provided by white bark pine? Does that mean the tree becomes less valuable to us? And why isn't its intrinsic value enough for people to care about it? So in my pondering, I began to unpackage and really qualify the key ecosystem services documented in the literature that white bark pine provides. So, you know, as my slide in the beginning of my presentation, you know, it's a keystone species and, and shapes biodiversity. Um, maybe it's too early in this 
changing process to know if we are losing high elevation species because white bark pine has declined. I don't know. Um, I'm going to skip the hydrological influences and, and go to the food resources. So um, as Taz has said, Clark's nutcrackers can go find other seed sources. Um, there might be a breakdown in the mutualistic relationship between white bark and the birds um, if they leave. So that would definitely be a loss. Same for small granivorous mammals. They, they can get seeds other places. So I think they, are, um, they can adapt. Um, then we, we can look at grizzly bears too. And the dependency of grizzly bears on white bark pine cones was one of the reasons the GYE interagency monitoring was partially funded for about a decade. Um, the, they had to monitor grizzly bear food um, through the outbreak, actually, the Mount Pine Beetle outbreak. And a primary argument in the listing, delisting debate focused on grizzly food decline. Uh, what I know, and from consulting with the USGS grizzly study team folks, is that bears have always been navigating good and bad cone years, and they still do. Now the issue is that there are fewer cone-producing trees. They still look for and use cones, but the duration and intensity is reduced. Um, and what researchers are finding is an increased use in large carcass consumption in the fall, so in, in September and October. And while nuts are one of their highest energy food resources, bears are really opportunists. And they found that you know, they eat anything from one to 20 different foods per day. And just an example of, of their ability to adapt, there's an area on the northern edge of Yellowstone. It's a private ranch and they bring cattle from big timber um, every year. And in doing so, I think, and bringing their feed, they introduced wild caraway into their fields and it has taken off. And the bears have found this wild caraway. And so every year you can go park up on the road and watch bears. It's like watching cows. So I think the highest number they've seen at one time was 17 grizzlies feeding on this wild caraway in these fields. Um, and it's been happening probably for about 12 years. From their provisional integrated population modeling efforts that they presented at the 2021 YES conference, they're finding a slower but positive population growth um, and fall fat deposition hasn't changed when they compared 2000 to two, and 2009 to 2010, 2020. So to this point, bears have been able to adapt their diets to meet food resource challenges. So for now, it appears that animals you know, they have adapted to decreases in white bark on the landscape. And now I want to just talk about the hydrological services because these are really my go-to, this is my go-to justification whenever I run into the public on the trail or when asked about why this tree is important. I go here quick because this is a common tie to all of us. The mountains are our water towers and we all need and want plenty of good clean water for various reasons from the people, the fisher people who want to be able to fish all summer and healthy waters to the wheat farmers in the Midwest. Uh, but interestingly, this is the one ecosystem service that I kind of question the most, even though it seems like one of the most important services. And in the literature, most of the citations on this very important service come from, from one resource, um, and that is Farns 1990s. It's a symposium presentation on white bark pine ecosystems. So I guess I'm just not really sure on this one, but fortunately, there is a Montana State grad student, Tio Ratu, doing her thesis on how different white bark pine stands affect snow accumulation and how accumulation affects stream flow. So maybe we'll all have a better understanding of this really important um, service when she completes her project. So there's no pressure on you there, Tio. And this brings me back to why isn't white bark pine's intrinsic value enough justification to conserve them to the lengths taken to save the sequoias. Uh, the public seems really willing to do whatever it takes to save these iconic and revered giant trees. And I'm not so sure that white bark pine will ever get the same support and treatment. Here, this was, I think, the fire last summer or two summers ago when they're actually wrapping 
like Sergeant Major, one of these real iconic trees um, in, in to fire resistant wrap. So I think we need to be realistic about the fate of whitebark pine given the exacerbation of threats and pace of change we are witnessing. If you understand the rate and magnitude of climate change, the science is telling us that in the not so distant future, we will be observing very different ecosystems where whitebark pine exists. So what can we do about this? None of us wanna be spectators and just watch whitebark pine blink out. So I think it's going to take a combination of efforts to keep whitebark pine on the landscape in the future in some capacity. This is where my sister would start waving her arms like one of those folks who guides in airplanes to the walkway. Uh, it's kind of like I'm circling and I need to park the point of this presentation before you all run out of listening patience. After going through the ecosystem service exercise that I, I did, um, while I do think whitebark pine is intrinsically valuable, in my opinion, the fact that whitebark pine is a pioneer species seems like the most significant trait and hopefully the one that with some assistance, we will get whitebark pine through this challenging period. It's a badass survivor tree. And this is where I want to finally introduce the RAD framework that I mentioned in my abstract. I attended an excellent presentation by Stephen Jackson a couple of weeks ago, and this really resonated with me. So the resist, accept, direct basically expands on step number three in the Climate Smart Conservation Framework. And it was developed more recently by the same agencies that promoted Climate Smart. RAD is another decision framework that resource managers can use as a tool to make informed, strategic, and purposeful choices on how and where to respond to, respond to climate change. Change is happening. We're not going back to the 20th century conditions. So it's imperative that every single management action we take considers climate change and future ecological transformation. As I said, so much of our energy and resources have been going into resisting change. And the more change there is, the harder it becomes to resist. After this summer, I'm realizing that resisting on a forest landscape scale is probably not feasible. But by working in the resist realm, we do feel like we're doing something at least. Accepting is easy. You don't have to do anything but observe. But it's double hard to sit on your hands as things unfold when you don't know what, how the situation is going to play out. And you might not like the direction it's going, so doing nothing is double hard. So what about directing, where we th think about guiding ecosystem change as much as we can to a more desirable state? I think directing is really rarely considered, maybe because it's really, really hard, or maybe because it's just plain scary and seems too daunting. Because in directing, first we have to define our collective goals, which we might not all agree on, and then we have to figure out how to achieve those goals. And this is novel territory, so we're going into the unknown with all sorts of uncertainties, and there aren't a whole lot of examples that we can look to for guidance except some of those really horrible, gone bad introductions of species to control another species. So all of this is pretty scary and it takes a lot of courage to consider directing change. But Climate Smart and the RAD frameworks are about being deliberate and strategic. And because whitebark pine is a badass pioneer species, I think we should be capitalizing on this now to ensure that at least some population of whitebark pine remains somewhere on the landscape through assisted migration. And in my opinion, and this is my opinion, not the National Park Service's opinion, all management actions need to consider future climate change scenarios and should be directed toward planting whitebark pine in areas to the best of our current knowledge um, where we can predict future refugia. We will still have to practice many of the actions in the resist category, especially those that protect cone producing trees, regardless of their blisterous resistance, keep, you know, or not. Um, we need to continue to identify future refugia. And I am most familiar with Tony Chang's 2014 publication on projected habitat for whitebark pine, but I do know others have and continue to model whitebark pine refugia. So time is now to start planning in those areas. It might not work, but what do we have to lose? 
you know, if we have any hope of shepherding white bird pine through this challenging period, we have to start planning strategically for the future. And I know there are a lot of hurdles that are real and that make assisted migration difficult. But if we can identify the ones where we can figure a way around them, then maybe it's not so daunting. Um, money's always going to be a limiting resource, and potentially seed sources will be as well. Um, so we have to start thinking outside our management as usual box by getting creative and innovative in our approaches. And so I've started to do this a little bit, and given all the miles that I've hiked for work, um, I always thought it would be a perfect opportunity for the white bark pine crews to somehow plant seeds as we walked. So I've been thinking about a, a planting trekking pole that with every pole plant, a seed gets deposited at just the right depth in the soil. Um, I, I, it, my patent is pending on that. Um, the other thing, my, my father played basketball for the University of Maryland, and in the off season, he delivered mail. So he took his mail shoes and carved out the soles so he could put lead weights in them and get a leg workout while he walked his mail route. So in his honor, I've developed in my head the Jerry Appleseed hiking boot. His name is Jerry. So with every step, you plant a few seeds. And then on the tech side, which I'm, my neighbor kind of gave me this idea. I, I just swapped out my flip phone for an iPhone, so that tells you how techy I am. Um, some of the, the folks who are more techie, they could develop some kind of a knockoff of Pokemon Go, but call it something like White Bark Wander, where players have to purchase seeds in the coordinates to this refugia, and then they get points with each seed they plant or something like that. Or maybe we could do some sort of like forest fen treasure hunting game. Um, I just like coming up with the ideas as I'm walking out there, but um, I'm sure there's a way we can engage the public in this effort. It's not just sequoias that are important. In closing, it is my opinion that we have to factor climate change into all of our collective actions, and planning in future refugees should be a top priority right now. I also think that it is probably time to shift our thinking from a single species to a more holistic landscape view. In the past, we've had the luxury to get locked into single species, but I sometimes worry that we are missing the forest for the white bark pine tree. For example, in Taz's presentation in January, she talked about the importance of dug fir for Clark's nutcrackers and that managers need to consider a mosaic approach in restoration efforts. And after my experience this summer, I'm wondering if white bark pine is not serving the ecosystem services that it used to. What is now, if anything is, and are we missing something because we're so laser focused on white bark pine? That's probably a whole nother topic in itself for a whole nother time, but um, just my thoughts. Thanks for listening to my rambling. And instead of questions, it'd be really great to hear other people's thoughts on, on this. Thank you. Erin, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Sorry for the sound. I think that's part of my computer's issue. <laughs> I think my volume was all the way up, and I and it was yeah, quite, I couldn't, yeah. it was for others. Well, thank you. And yeah, so I want to encourage everyone to you know start this dialogue. Um, feel free to look. Oh, that's my hand. Um, raise your hand, please, if you can, down at the bottom of your screen, and, and so we can um, allow you to chat. We're going to try this out. Okay, yeah, I see, and, I see and Logan. Please, yeah, other folks might have the answers. So I just was hoping this would be more of a dialogue and not, I mean, I can tell you about the monitoring, but there's there's other folks who know way more than I do about propagation of seeds and stuff, so. Erin, can I start with a question? Absolutely. <laughs> um, so uh, in, in your opinion and not the Park Service's opinion, yeah. <laughs> um, what is the most important initial step that management could take? Um, like, you know, whether it, yeah, the, the initial step. I think just really, I think right now we need to identify future refugia and we need to start getting seeds up there. Um, I, this last summer was so alarming to me. There was just so much going on. Um, I hadn't seen, it, it was like this trifecta of things 
in a, in a lot of the areas I was going to. So, um, yeah, I just, I got pretty discouraged towards the end of the summer, but it just made me think, all right, we, we have to start planting. And I know, you know, there's the wilderness issue and, um, that's why I figured if we got the public involved and they went up there, you know, I'd get fired, but <laughs> the public wouldn't for planting seeds in wilderness, you know? So, but yeah, I think just identifying the fugia mm-hmm. and then getting seeds up there right now. Yeah. I loved your inventions too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so all right. there's a, a group in their Montana. Somebody told me about them. They're with the forest service and you present them with ideas and they're engineers and they'll develop your product for you. And it's a government thing. So oh, that's I thought great. I, might, I might send my idea to them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Jesse, Logan, you should have the ability to chat. Yeah, I, you know, what a nice talk and thank you. Uh, thought provoking and really insightful. Disturbing to hear that uh, beetles are back uh, rearing their head down in the southern part of the ecosystem. Yeah. But thinking of uh, of refugia seems the most obvious is uh, the current alpine and places like the uh, Beartooth Plateau and then the high winds. Is that kind of uh, what you're thinking in refugia? Yeah, I mean, honestly, anything that we think will work in the future, I think we should start going up there and just planting, yeah. I, I think it's all open, you know, we've, we've got to get them in places that we think they might survive, even, even just pockets of them. I mean, I, I started thinking like maybe what we're doing is, is like creating a white bark pine zoo in a sense. But if you think about zoos, I mean, often the species they have in there, they have helped those species get through really rough times. So, you know, if we can just preserve a few pockets of white bark to carry them through hopefully this change now um yeah i anywhere that we think they'll survive i I think should be open i know um holly cairns we were talking a little bit and she said that um the survival rate is pretty grim in some places so uh, you know but i don't know if we do nothing if we keep doing all the research and stuff we're just we're just wasting a lot of time um, based on what I saw last summer. And you're right, Jesse, it was, it was, uh, all of us got really sad when we saw how much mortality is going on down there. And I'm just really afraid it's going to start waving up this way now. So. Yeah, well, thank you. Glenda, feel free to um, unmute yourself. I think I am unmuted, right? Right. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thanks. Hey, Aaron, when you mentioned refugia, I know there's been a lot of different discussions using, I think it might be conservation areas in some places, but what kind of characteristics are you thinking of when you say a refugia? So, you know, basically... If you read Tony Chang's report um, or his paper, sorry, those areas that he identified. Um, and so any, you know, like north facing slopes, like any of the characteristics that we know white bark pine do a little better than others. So those would be, you know, just continuing to, to model areas and selecting areas in, in the GYE and other places too. I don't, I don't know how much has been done outside the GYE. I'm not that familiar. Um, with other work, but yeah, just just where we think that in the future they will have a better chance of surviving. Okay, so basically site characteristics. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 sorry. Thanks. Thanks. Jeff? Okay, yep, Jeff, you're up next. Jeff, we can't hear you if you are speaking. I think he's saying he wants in on the royalties when my trekking pole goes to market. Yeah.
put it in the chat. Yeah, just if maybe if you want to put it in the chat. And once everyone um, has spoken that wants to, Aaron, I'll go through the chat and read some questions. Hi, Aaron. Uh, this is Vlad Kovalenko. I had a quick Hi. question about uh, some of the your innovative uh, seed planting ideas. Um, can you comment on the, uh, isn't there a pretty uh, well-researched lack of um, viability in planting uh, white bark seeds straight into the soil? Or were you also kind of talking about um, planting seedlings that have been raised in a nursery? Yeah, I think like my ideas were just seedling or seeds, sorry. And yeah, I, I know that it's um, the survival of the seeds isn't great, but I also know that there's some seeds that like Mary Mihalovich, they need to get, they, I guess they can, um, basically they won't be viable and they need to get out there. So why not, you know, why not just start putting them out there if they're just going to go in the trash. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, just something to try. <laughs> sure. I don't seedlings that that's a whole other issue, but for me, I've always felt like, oh, well, I'm up there. It's too bad I don't have a way to just like start scattering some seeds around since I'm up here. Right. Cool. Thank you. Okay, Aaron. Uh, Doug, <laughs> Ken Doug Kenfield has asked any advances in vegetative propagation of white bark pine? I don't know the answer to that. Somebody else on the call might know. Like you, do you, <laughs> with your work? Um, well, not at this point. Um, <laughs> once everything is analyzed, maybe uh, hopefully we'll have um, some more um, advances with it to be determined. Oh, Erin, would you um, remind me of um, what are the rules for planting in wilderness? I, I know that um, it, it is, like I said, an Achilles heel in some cases, like even with this national strategy, there's, you know, when we were identifying core areas, so much of those are in wilderness, like in Yellowstone. And right now they don't allow planting in those areas um, for just, you know, willy nilly planting. So um, that is kind of a roadblock. And I, I don't know the specifics, to be honest, and somebody else might know as well, but um, I didn't know, somebody put in the chat that you could put seeds, but not seedlings. Um, so, but, and it, I think it does vary too, like Glacier, they are, they've been historically planting, but they kind of got grandfathered in because most of the mortality up there is from blister rust, which is an exotic. So they, they've had a lot more leeway with planting than other parks. So um, Teton has just like a test plantation there, but um, Yellowstone does not plant. Maybe, maybe if there's road construction or something like that. So, but yeah. Thanks. Um, so Joan Dudney has asked, what about developing better be beetle control, early detection and pesticides? Yeah, um, that's all, again, that's all in the resist category and, um, you know, we're, we're doing that, but I just worry that we can't do it fast enough from based on what I saw last summer. It's just the time. Um, everything's happening really fast, unfortunately. And, and to be honest, last summer is the first time I really felt that way. So... Deborah Patlas says, considering the threats to all life stages um, from blister rust, insects, and ins extensive fire, where would there be refugia from those issues? Many of the young white bark pine survivors that I see at high elevation are afflicted and dying from rust before they are close to seed production. What would make some places more viable? Yeah, I mean, that's what we're up against. So I, I just think we have to try. I, like I said, it, it, we might fail, but if we keep thinking about it and do nothing, then um, you know, doing something's a little better than nothing. Right? And if you're right, um, 
everything yeah up high there's rust um but i don't know my hope is that we can at least help some of them survive <laughs> and I, th I think we have to plan it just takes too long for you know them to get to any sizable cone producing stage so we're kind of behind the eight ball right now All right, this next question I think is really interesting because I've thought about this as well. Um, from Jesse Salix, what about considering the lower elevation areas that white bark pine occurs in, sagebrush parks in Southwest Montana? Um, so I'm thinking of the, I think it's the Flannery and Keen paper from yeah, outside of Dillon. Uh, right, and yeah, Emily Giverson talks about, you know, seeing those two. So that, try that too. I mean, why not? Um, I think the seedlings do tend to bake pretty bad. They're so in that stage, they're definitely more susceptible to drought and heat. So, um, but again, why not, <laughs> you know, let's just start to plant. I'm just going to keep saying that we just need to plant. <laughs> And anybody else feel free to chime in because again, I'm, I'm not an expert on all of this. I just wanted to share my thoughts <laughs> about what I was seeing last summer. Just reading through yes. other questions, yeah. Yeah, if anyone who's sharing their thoughts in the chat want to unmute and talk about it. Um, Go right ahead, Jesse. Your hand is still up. Um, if you have a new question, or um. yeah, more of a comment, I guess. The uh, you know the Fish and Wildlife has nominated white bark as a threatened species, and anticipate in the you know next month or two that it ought to be designated. And in their uh, statement uh, nominating white bark. They failed to identify critical habitat and they just gave really short, uh, you know, consideration to climate change. The focus was almost entirely on uh, blister rust resistance. And it seems that's counter to everything that's been said today. Uh, comment? I, I think climate needs to be considered in all of our management actions. Yeah, but what about the identification of critical habitat, which also they declined to do, to do and apparently is not going to happen? Yeah, um, I, I, I guess I don't really know what to say about that. I mean, it's I think that was people were pretty bummed that that didn't happen and it. And it's my understanding that if they had, it would have opened this big can of worms and how can you protect the habitat um, on a landscape scale like that? So, um, so I don't well, know, Jesse. It seems, yeah, it seems like you've done it. You know, you pointed to Tony's uh, research modeling, identifying those habitats, at least in the greater Yellowstone, maybe I'm missing something on this too. You know, just thinking about the greater Yellowstone, not the entire distribution of white bark. Yeah, I, I just, I don't know why they didn't consider those things. I, I you know, um, it, it's a shame, but <laughs> I did it. it. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Jeff, we can hear you. Awesome. Okay, Great. sorry about that. <clears throat> um, Aaron, I have a question about your thoughts on daylighting. Uh, I live in <laughs> work in the Big Sky area. A lot of our forests that were hit hard by mountain pine beetle in the last outbreak. Um, anecdotally, there's a lot of regen and a lot of it subalp and fir, but there's also quite a bit of white bark pine regeneration. Um, what are your thoughts on utilizing this as a tool for promoting white bark regen into the future? 
Yeah, so it's interesting. It's a good question because um, I'm collaborating with a few folks on a, a looking at the efficacy of thinning. And um, I collected about a thousand cores in 2012 from an area that Melissa Jenkins had daylighted on Sawtell. Um, so I was looking at just growth release and, and um, curious to see, you know, from a past beetle outbreak that occurred on the Gallatin crest here, I was able to do like a treatment and control. And, um, I, you know, I, I, my thought was like this, this overstory disturbance from the last beetle outbreak was going to release all these understory white bark. So um, we're, we're actually getting the cores red pretty soon. Um, but I think they don't, there's not a lot of data on the efficacy of thinning right now. So I, I think the Forest Service really wants to use that as a tool, but they want to know if it, if it really works. Um, where they daylighted down in Sawtell, Liz Davies went in about 10 years later, I think. I can't remember. That. Melissa did it in like 1999 and then Liz went in and it, there were like 1,200 or more trees per hectare. I mean, all these little babies had come up. So it looked really effective down there. I think that, um, interestingly, I started really thinking about water with white bark pine. Like I said, it's always my go-to whenever I try and get somebody to care about this tree, you know, how it, it preserves the snowpack up there. And I wondered like, if this is really our, what our collective, like as, as humans, main thing, we need water. Um, what white bark really, maybe we don't want to thin around white bark up in these elevations because they do, again, they're this nurse tree and lets all the other species come in. And so, Maybe those other species are then preserving the snowpack up there. Um, I know there's sublimation and all that kind of stuff that factors into it, but um, I, yeah. So now I'm a little torn about thinning. Also, I think there is some question about whether when you do thin, if rust can then, it's easier for rust to go through the stand um, because oftentimes other species, you know, the, the spores can land on those. So um, yeah, I, it seems like it increases the vigor of individual trees when you do that. Um, and I think for like some of these seed source trees that we rely on that it's important and plus just to protect them from fire. Uh, but yeah, um, the understory like trying to thin around seedlings. Yeah, I think we have to kind of, not sure the efficacy right now on that because you can also, they can also get really hot. So I guess there's, there's a balance, but anyways, it'll be interesting to see what we find out with those cores. I think that is everyone that wanted to discuss. Um, thank you to those who have shared your comments and um, have unmuted yourself and asked. Um, we have one more question from Amy, Amy Gannon. Any research or case studies on the effects of thinning and resistance to beetles? I don't know. Some, maybe somebody else knows that. Jesse, do you know by chance? Sorry, I uh, muted my uh, phone, but the um, the I'm <laughs> I'm looking for a paper right now. Um, the uh, Colin uh, Mayer's uh, thesis. 
on uh, on thinning showed pretty mixed uh, results, and in some cases, uh, the uh, thinning was apparently effective. In some places, it was uh, uh, detrimental, and it mm. seems to me often thinning treatments occur with no control and no follow-up. And, uh, and yeah. as you indicate, I think, you know, but it's, it seems like there's good information in this, in his thesis, which uh, was uh, what, 2018 uh, PhD thesis from University of Montana. And the uh, Colin Tail Taylor Mayer, M-A-H-E-R, and I, I don't know if, uh, you know, re referee journal publications have come from that. I expect they have, and I'm not aware of them. But that's a, you know, the thesis is really, I found a good uh, resource. Thanks, Jesse. Mm-hmm. All right, well, we are just at about our time. So um, just wanted to thank you, Aaron, again so much for such an awesome presentation. And thank you um, to everyone in the audience for attending and for your interest um, in this incredible science that we do. Yeah, so next joining me in the field, anybody, I'm always happy to have folks on the mic and you can use one of my time. <laughs> I've gone, I can attest that it's a great time. <laughs> Um, so next month, we will be joined uh, by Chris Ray on April 19th, who will be presenting on assessing vulnerabilities in the mutualisms between white bark pine and the Clark's Nutcracker in Sierra Cascade Parks. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next month. Thank you.